Uh, the topic that's on my mind uh, this morning is God's gift of marriage. Okay? God's gift of marriage. And little people, you may be thinking, well, I don't have to listen to this one. I'm not married. Lord willing, one day you will be. There are some folks among us who, Lord willing, are a lot closer to that than you are. And so this topic is really relevant for all of us if for nothing else, to where we're in a position to give each other godly counsel on marriage. Because there is a lot of bad information out there. Pretty much anything you watch on TV, or in a movie, or read in a book, other than this one, is skewed. It's distorted. It's, it's just wrong. Um, and so we need to have a strong understanding about what God set up, and how do we fit into that. And so where I want to start is go all the way back to the beginning. Origin of marriage, that'd be in Genesis chapter 2. Right? Genesis chapter 2, the Lord said, the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Right? Meet means fit, right, proper. A help that is fit for the man. Okay? And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. He gave the names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help fit for him. Right? Meat for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he, God, took one of Adam's ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And then you get a therefore. Right? We've talked a lot about when we're reading Scripture, when we get to buts and therefores and because ofs, that we need to go back to what we've read before because it's given an explanation for why something is. So because of all that, a help meet for him that God made the woman, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave, cling, adhere to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That was the creation of the institution of marriage. Shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now that is not just referring to coming together in the marriage bed. That is a new unit, a new team, a new body that is being created. Where there were two, it is now one. Right? shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So, just for context, when is this taking place? This is taking place on the sixth day of creation. If you go back over to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, and the fowl, and the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, and the fowl, and over every living creature that moveth upon the earth. <coughs> so they were created on that sixth day, Adam and Eve. They were blessed, told to be fruitful and multiply. But is that it? Is that all is that all marriage is about? Just be fruitful and multiply? That's, that's part of it. But that's not it. All right. I want to go forward to the New Testament to see what Jesus has to say. In Matthew chapter let's start in Matthew nineteen.
Now, the Pharisees had come unto Jesus tempting Him, testing Him. They wanted to try and entrap Him in the Word, something that they could get Him to accuse Him. So that was their purpose when they came up and they asked Him a question. They said, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So he's asking about divorce. Is it, is it okay for any cause? And He answered and said, Have you not read that He which made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause... Shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? God made them, and God said that. Right? That's what we just read. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Right? Adam, it was literally a piece of his flesh was taken out and made his wife. Right? Now, we don't have that process recreated among us, but that's the image that it points to. That's how close a husband and wife become, is that you're now sharing one body. You're one unit. Right? And so the question he was put for is, can he put away his wife for every cause? And the answer was, God's joined them together. Okay? Often, brides and grooms get together and they have a, a big wedding. And sometimes they get the misconception that they're the primary focus of it. Right? They think it's about them. It's not. The primary actor on the wedding day is God himself. He is the one who is taking these two individuals and making them one. God has joined them together. Let not man put it asunder. Don't let man break apart what God's joined. And so they ask him as a follow-up, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever putteth away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. All right? So... As you're going into a marriage, you need to understand that the duration of this is the rest of your life. Right? There is only one exception that says that you can put away your spouse and be able to marry another without committing adultery, and that's in the case of fornication. Fornication is a, is a broad term used throughout the New Testament to refer to uh, all manner of, of sexual sin, where you are committing unfaithfulness, against your, your spouse. All right? But the point of that is the duration is, this is not easy in, easy out. Easy out. This is not no-fault divorce. This is all these um, distortions that we have today. I mean, you look at any tabloid about the celebrities, it's, it's how long have they been divorced? They've made it a year. Whoa! Right? I know the past few weeks we've had 55 years and 37 years and Got 10 years coming up in a couple weeks, right? Those are amazing testaments to God's grace. Right? So what, what is the duration, kids? When you go into marrying somebody, it's for life. Okay? For life. Till death do us part, and that ain't no joke. Okay? It's not just something you say. Till death do That's the duration, right? And Jesus you know, repeated that concept back in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, 31 and 32. Now the context in the Sermon on the Mount is he's, he's taking things that folks had understood about the law and he's raising the expectation, right? Yeah. Hate your enemies. He's saying, no, love your enemies. Right? You're getting this, this elevation of the grace and love that's going to be applied. So in 31 it says, It hath been said, uh, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a right in divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, again, that one exception, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Right? So, kids, one day when you have a spouse, there are things that are going to be hard. You're going to have bad days. And your spouse is going to have bad days. You have to have the mindset of this is permanent. This is not something I can just walk away when it gets hard. Okay? So, 
The duration of marriage, one, is created by God, following His pattern. The duration is, is permanent. It's through life. right? And the operation is that God's the one who does it. Created by Him, and ultimately, it's for Him. Now, as we are in the throes of maybe having a hard time in our marriage, sometimes we lose focus on the fact that marriage is actually just a temporary blessing. Do you understand that? Luke chapter 20. Our marriages to our spouse are limited to this world only. Luke chapter 20, verse 34 and 36. And again, they came uh, tempting him, asking about, you know, if seven brothers all had the same wife, you know, consecutively after one died. Um, they'd ask who in the resurrection, um, whose wife would she be? And Jesus answered and said, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. That's referring to, to here and now. We marry and we are given in marriage. But they which are accounted worthy to obtain the world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels. No, nope, it doesn't say they become angels. We don't become angels. We're equal to an angel. And that we no longer marry or are given in marriage and we don't die. And are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. And so it is important to recognize that your opportunity to care and love for your spouse is here. Take advantage of it now. Care for her or him with sincerity and affection because this is your shot. It's till death to us part. And then that's it. This is a blessing that is limited to this world uh, only, and you can see that again over in Romans chapter 7, and the illustration is talking about the law, but the point being is that um, Romans 7, 2, the woman who hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Right? So we are loosed from our, our spouses upon our death. Right? And in glory, we'll have a perfect love one for another. Um, but it's not going to be based on this um, connection that we have here be below. All right? Now I say all this, and, and you've probably heard all this many times. And it's really just to, to build up to the purpose. Because if we have a bad understanding of what the purpose of marriage is, it's easy to get off track. Um, the world will tell you the purpose of marriage is it's to make you happy. Right? That's, that's kind of the world's ultimate goal, right? I, I want to achieve my happiness. Right? I'm here to tell you that your marriages have a bigger purpose than just your individual happiness. Now, there can be great joy and happiness within a marriage, but it's bigger than that. So I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 22. And I'm going to read... Um, well, we'll go, we'll go slowly. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as the church is the, is, Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Now, who's he writing to? This letter is written to believers. Right? You can see that back in you know, verse 1 of chapter 5. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. All right? So wives, the admonition is to submit yourselves to your husband. Submit, what does that mean? It means to be subordinate, to, to obey. Um, and how are you doing that? You're doing it as unto the Lord. right? This is the same concept that's given over in, in Colossians. When we're in our, our secular job or we're serving somebody else, you know, it's Colossians 3 and in 22 and 23, it says, Servants, obey your masters in all things, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. So sisters, when you're obeying and serving your husband and submitting to him, you're doing it as directly unto the Lord. That's the attitude, that's the heart, that's the, whether he deserves it or not. Right? It's not because he's perfect and therefore I'm willing, it's because the Lord has given me this instruction and I'm submitting to the Lord and he will, he will honor that. That is, that is glorifying to him. All right? For the husband is the head of the wife, the leader of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior 
of the body. Okay, that's that's who the head of our church is. Right? I, I'm I'm not the the leader here. I'm an under shepherd at best, and I have to look at our our head, Jesus, who's who's living and reigning. This is not someone who's gone. He is alive and reigning on the side right hand of God right now, and we have to look to Him for what we do that glorifies Him. All right, and so. As he is the head of this church and we have to submit to him, it's the same way that sisters are called to submit to their husbands. All right. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, husbands, love your wives. Okay. Husbands, love your wives. This is not the Hollywood version of love. Hollywood's version says, I will love you as long as you do whatever, as long as you make me happy. Right? That's, not, that's not the biblical definition of love. Biblical definition of love you'd find over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Use the word charity, but it means basically the same thing. Charity. Charity suffereth long. Okay? So as you're reading through this, I want you know, men to be thinking about, I show my wife that I love her by being long-suffering, being patient. I show my wife that I love her by being kind. I show my wife that I love her by not being jealous or being envious. I show my love, wife that I love her by, by not vaunting myself up, by puffing myself up with pride. Right? I show my wife that I love her because I don't behave myself unseemly. I don't seek my own I'm not easily provoked. I'm not thinking evil of her or what her intentions are. I'm bearing all things. Again, emphasis on patience there. I rejoice not in iniquity when bad things happen. I'm not happy about it, but I rejoice in the truth. I believe all things. I hope all things. I endure all things. That's love. right? That's real love. That's God's love. That's the pattern of God's love towards you. How patient and long-suffering is God the Father toward you? I mean, let's be honest. The, the vile sins that we commit every day. In His righteous judgment, He would be fine to strike us down for, for one of them. He chose not to. And in fact, He chose to put the burden the price for those sins, onto His Son, who came and suffered incredible, infinite humiliation just by coming into creation, much less being subject to mortal parents, obeying, obeying them, living a sinless life, and then being rejected by His own and dying on the cross. This is the pattern that He shows towards you. This is what real love is. If God had the standard of love that we do sometimes, the world will teach us that I'll love you as long as you love me. Y'all, we'd be in a world hurt. Right? We, we, we can't merit His love. That's, that's the definition of grace, right? Unmerited favor. Okay? So men, as you need to think about how do I love my wives, those are the things we apply. And who are we trying to emulate? Who are we trying to copy in our love? The standard that we have to, just like the sisters have to submit as the church does to Christ, we have to love as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself for it. For what purpose? That he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. All right? Christ gave of Himself to the highest degree for the long-term good of His church. Okay. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now here's the kicker. You're one, right? So when you're loving your wife, you're loving yourself. I mean, it's, it's really the epitome of if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? If you're taking care of your spouse... Life is better. For no man, uh, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. All right. 
nourish it, nourisheth and cherish it. All right, you may think, well, I don't nourish or cherish my body. That's just strange. All right, what does it mean to, to nourish? This is talking about men, your obligation to lift your wife up, to build them up. I mean, train, to cherish literally means to, uh, to nourish literally means to, to, to train up, to rear up. The same way that you care about training up a small child. Men, it's your job as spiritual leader of your family to be encouraging and leading and training up your wives. That's your responsibility. Okay? And, you know, cherish, what does that mean? Literally means to warm or to brood. Like a brood chicken, right? Warming the eggs. It's that you are creating a warm and loving environment. So if you're doing that for yourself, you definitely need to be doing it for your own body. Even as Christ the Lord for the church. For we are members of His body. We as the church are members of the Lord's body of His flesh and His bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Here's the kicker. Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church. Alright, so if you take nothing away from this message other than this, the purpose of your marriage is to glorify God because you are a small image of Christ and His church. Your marriage, men, you have the role of pointing to Christ. Sisters, you have the role of pointing to the church. How y'all carry about yourself is either going to be a good reflection, a true reflection of Christ's love for the church and the church's submission to Christ, or it's going to be a bad one. But you are like a mobile billboard pointing to Christ in your marriage. It's not just about you and your happiness. It's about how you glorify your Father through your lives together. Right? Now, y'all seen those trucks? They're like the little billboards. Right? There's nothing on the back. It's just a billboard on both sides. Imagine one of them is you got a big billboard on the side that's, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And what if you see the driver of that truck weaving through town just drunk off his mind? You'd think there's a little inconsistency in the messaging, right? We're the same way when we get wrapped up in self, get lifted up with pride, when we tear down or when we hurt our spouses, when we get wrapped up in sin, and, and, and it happens. The kicker, though, is how quickly do we swallow our pride, humble ourselves, and apologize so that we can be an accurate representation of Christ's love for the church and the church's love and submission to Christ. That's what we're pointing to. Right? It's bigger than us. Okay? So men, men, you have a great deal of responsibility. Okay? It is on your head to determine what is best for your family. Let me put it this way. Does Christ do everything that we as a church ask or want Him to do? No. He knows best, and sometimes the answer is no. So men, you cannot just say take the excuse that Well, my wife wants to do this, therefore we're going to do it, whether it's right or wrong. The decision, I'm talking particularly the spiritual leadership of your family, it rests on you. Sometimes you have to be able to say, no, this is the path that we need to take. Because ultimately, the responsibility is coming back to you. Right? Adam was rebuked because he hearkened unto his wife. She was deceived by the serpent. He wasn't. And so he knew what he was doing was wrong and did it anyway and did it willfully. And when the Lord came to rebuke him, he tried to point the finger and said, well, Lord, it's kind of really your fault. You know, the woman that you gave me. No, that's not, that's not an acceptable excuse, man. The buck has to stop with us. Now, we have to be very giving of ourselves. Right? That's, that's what we're commanded, to love. And young people, y'all may have checked out. I want you to think about this. Be watching mama and daddy. Okay? 
they're the closest thing you've got to an example, Lord willing, of this. So that you can learn that when you're grown, what it means to be a husband, or what it means to be a godly wife, right? The purpose is to reflect Christ's love for his church. Okay? It is a big, big, big deal to be married. It's a big deal about who you choose to marry. Right? So young folks who are closer to that choosing process. This doesn't work if you're not both seeking God. First. Now, Lord is gracious. He can cause a change in any of His children's heart. But you don't know what they are unless they've shown evidence of being born again. And so it is foolish to marry somebody who you do not believe is a born-again child of God. Because you're asking for hurt. You're asking for trouble. Because all these things, the only people who are going to try to follow along with Him are God's children. The rest of the world don't care. They're still stuck in that land of being dead and trespasses and sins where your biggest idol is self. And you and I still have that idol in our, our life, but daily we have to take that down and put Christ back in its proper, His proper place as first in our life. Okay? So it is vitally important to choose a godly spouse. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. I've heard this a hundred times. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So if you're a born-again child of God, and you're trying to seek Him and trying to serve Him in your life, why in the world would you become one with somebody who's not following it. Do not think that you can stay on the straight and narrow and somehow force them on. It's going to take an act of God's grace. And you have no control over that and no guarantee that He will. And so what will happen is that you will be yoked together and you will depart. It may be fast, it may be slow. But you need a godly spouse who is going to encourage you and build you up and be willing to have this as the ultimate authority within your life. Because if you don't have this as the foundation of your marriage, all you've got is opinion. And brothers, your opinion ain't any better than hers. Not in the world. But if you are both believers and you can both study out the Scriptures on an issue and come to this is what the Scriptures would say, we have to submit to it, then you have a decider. You have something firm to build your life upon. Something that doesn't change, regardless of... I mean, your opinions now at 20 can be wildly different than your opinions at 40, unless it's based on something that doesn't change. Right? This is why so often you get to the spot where you hear it, well, this is just not the, the person I married so and so many years ago. No! You're both going to grow up. You're both going to change. And unless you're both anchored on the same thing, there's no guarantee it's going to be changing in the same direction. And it's certainly not going to be Pursuing Christ. Right? The world hates Christ. That's the world is at enmity with Christ. That's 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 scripture. Right? And so why in the world will we seek to yoke ourselves together with someone who is not going to be seeking after him? Right? Okay. Brother Parish, would you ever hitch two tractors together to plow, one going north and the other going east? 
You could try. Right? One of them's eventually going to get pulled off course. You're not going to go continue north, right? Something's probably going to get torn up and broken. You may even crash together eventually. Right? It's going to be a mess. It is vitally important that you choose a spouse. And sisters, let's put it honestly, if Scripture says you have to submit and obey, you better pick somebody you're willing to obey that you know is willing to put Christ first in his life. Because it's much easier to submit to somebody who's trying to lead like Christ rather than lead like a dictator or authoritarian or, or whatever else. Someone who gets wrapped up in power, right? How did Christ lead? Christ, Christ led with humble, self-sacrificial love. That's something you can get behind. All right? Let's go over to Proverbs 31. Y'all know... Proverbs 31, and it's the lengthy description of the virtuous woman. And I'm not going to read the whole thing today. I just want one verse, and that's verse 10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Brothers, if you're married today and you have a virtuous woman, you've got something to put on your list of thanksgivings every morning. And the value... One, anybody ever found a ruby? I sure haven't. Right? But if you have a virtuous woman, you've got something far exceeding value and difficult to find. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Young men, as we're looking for a spouse, unfortunately we kind of get wrapped up in what they look like. Right? I mean, your brain can just go to mush with a pretty girl. And so before you get into that situation, and one, I would advise not to do one-on-one -on -one situations. I think church meetings and front porch with parents are a much better environment. Know that what you need to be looking for is godly character. Someone who is going to be a help meet fit for you to follow the Lord rather than a hindrance. Right? So if you can find someone who is exhibiting virtuous character... Rank that far above just vain looks. Because guess what? We all get old, Lord willing, and all that will fade. But if you've got a foundation based on godly, meek, and gentle spirit, that's something that can last a lifetime. All right? Who can find a virtuous woman? How about back to Proverbs chapter 19? Proverbs 19 and verse 14 says, A house and riches are inheritance of the fathers. Says, Your daddy can leave you a house and riches. Sure. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. You know what prudent means? Intelligent. Circumspect. All right. We're not here trying to say the scripture teaches the wife should be uh, just walked all over, or completely silent, or have no role in the marriage, that's, that's not scriptural. It's saying, men, that God gave a help meet that's fit for you. It's, good. <laughs> it's not a good thing that you're alone. And so giving you a virtuous and intelligent wife, if you want to be intelligent, you listen to her advice. right? Your wives can see blind spots that us men, they just, particularly on emotional aspects, or how things that you do will impact other people. i am really got a blind spot about that. Y'all often have to deal with that. And more than often than not, I'll get a, a nudge from my wife and say, yeah, but have you considered? And I'll go, no. Right? That is her fulfilling that role of being that help. Help for me. Right? And so, looking for a prudent wife, and then when you find those men, if you have a prudent wife, again, thank God, because God gave it to you. That was a blessing from the Lord for you to have a prudent wife hey, let's not be so lifted up with pride that we don't use the blessings that he gave us, right? Again, back in chapter 18, and verse 22, Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Right? Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor to the Lord, right? 
Men, I point at myself here too. We don't need to be griping about our wives. Right? We don't need to be joking using terms of balls and chain or any of those other derogatory things. Because when you're doing that, you're insulting a gift from the Lord. Right? We need to nourish and cherish and love unconditionally. And if you're sitting here and you're, you're not married and you don't plan on being married anytime soon, you can be the one who's giving godly counsel when maybe somebody is spouting off. <laughs> right? It's one thing to vent and someone to listen and then give you godly counsel for how you can make things better. And it's another to listen to somebody vent and then kind of egg them on. Yeah, but it's so and so, right? So you may be an encourager. right? You may be in a position where you need to know what is a biblical marriage? What does it look like? And how can I encourage somebody when they're going through the hard times? Because hard times come. Because there are two sinners involved in every marriage. But the point is that when you find a wife, you found a good thing. And you've obtained favor of the Lord. All right. Let's go to 1 Timothy. I've kind of been picking on the men a little bit about um, choosing a godly spouse. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Say, so if we're able to give some criteria for what you would want to encourage a young sister to look for in a potential, yeah, that's right, David, sisters, and a potential husband. Now, the context here is it's given the criteria. Of a bishop. That's another word for pastor or an elder, right? It's given these qualifications that you have to have these in order to be ordained as a as a bishop. You know what bishop means? It means an overseer. So sisters, when you're choosing a spouse, you're 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 doing interviews for an overseer, right? So it's it's comparable. What does it say? A bishop then must be blameless. Husband of one wife. Well, obviously we're not there yet if we're choosing one out. Vigilant. What do you think it means to be vigilant? Someone whose eyes are open, who's looking ahead, who's looking for danger, who's looking for opportunities they can serve the Lord. Vigilant, as opposed to when we get our head in the, the cloud, where we go on autopilot, where we're just kind of oblivious to everything that's going on around us. You want someone who is vigilant, sober, sober in thought, sober in behavior, self-controlled, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, right, sisters? That if his job is to nourish and help train you up, you want somebody who's got some ability to teach, who has some knowledge in the Scripture. And men, if we can't say that we're meeting some of these criteria, we may not be ready to lead a wife, right? Just because we can and somebody says yes doesn't mean that maybe we're mature enough to have that responsibility. And maybe we need to be preparing ourselves in advance for being ready to step into that role. Right? And men, even if we're already married, these are still things that we can be working on developing. That we should be blameless, vigilant, sober, of good behavior. We should be a good example. Everything we do should be a good example for the little boys and for the little girls. Right? That as a man, I want them to be able to copy my behavior, not to learn, don't do it like that. Not given to wine, not allowing the, the, the things that we put in our body that hinder our mind, hinder our, our thoughts and our control and make us make bad decisions. Not given to that. Not a striker. I mean, someone who's not, not fighting, not using your hands or your fists. Not greedy of filthy lucre. This is, this is talking about covetousness. It's one thing to be in a role where you're providing for your family. That's good. That's honorable. That's just. It's another where you take that role to the extreme and say that I'm going to do this so I can be successful, where I can have more than I need, but I'm going to give more time and more energy and more devotion to my job, my career, my business, whatever it is, to the exclusion of my family that God has entrusted you to care for, not just with carnal things, but most importantly as you're leading them along the path and following Him. Okay? And so if we get out of whack in, in pursuing stuff too much, then we're not setting that good and godly example. Right? 
uh, patient, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Man, that's part of the definition of love, right? Patience and long-suffering and enduring. I mean, there's like three different synonyms within the definition of love about being patient. What do you think us men often struggle with? Lack of patience. Right. Patience. Not a brawler. Again, not a fighter. We shouldn't be out knocking folks' heads in when we don't get our way. Not covetous. <laughs> one that ruleth well his own house. And this one, sisters, if you're not married yet, you, you'll have a harder time doing. But if he's got these other attributes, he's well on his way to being able to learn how to do that. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. He must have a good report of them which are without. What does that mean? It means he has a good reputation of those without the church. You know, it's, it's a sad thing when somebody can be in the church, everyone knows them, everyone likes them, but then they act very differently out in the world. Whether they're a cheat or a liar or a drunk or, or whatever it is, men, we can't be too, too double-minded. We have to be consistent. Who we are in here needs to be the same person we are out there. And if we're not willing to show that out here, we need to drop that. Right? To have a good report, an, an honest reputation among those who are without the church. Right? Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay? This is a lot to take in. Right? Maybe hard for little people to be thinking about marriage. But do you know what we're trying to do as your parents right now? We're trying to train you up so that you can be a godly man, that you can seek Him with your whole heart, soul, strength, mind, and body. And if the Lord says fit to blend, send you a spouse, that you're ready to lead both a sister, your wife, and any children the Lord blesses you with. That's why we're training children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Teaching you what it means to be a follower of Christ now, so that when you get in that role, you don't go, I do, now what? <laughs> I had that experience. And I try not to use a lot of personal experiences up here. And so this is just, use it as a bad example. That, you know, I, I got married, okay, now I'm wearing a house. And what does that mean? Well, I thought stupidly, it mean I had to make every decision. Guess how well that went. <laughs> right, David? <laughs> right? Learning that it wasn't all about my poor noggin, that I had a resource and a spouse who's able to give me good, godly counsel. And unfortunately, I was not in a spot where I was seeking the Lord with my whole heart at that time. And so at times when she would get on fire for the Lord and want to be at church and want to do, do more, I was as cold as ice. And I drug her down. And it, it hindered our marriage for years. Because when one person would kind of get, get on a little bit, the other one would just be like, nope. And it would drag the other person down. All right? Now, we would still show up on Sunday mornings. Right? But Sunday evenings, no, that's too hard. You know, we got a kid now. He got a sleep schedule. Can't do that. Wednesday nights, oh, no, it's a 45-minute drive. And we would come up with the excuses because we weren't willing to make the effort together. And... One of us could not drag the other for very long. Right? It's like dragging a log. You can do it a little while, but pretty much you get tired of it. Why am I carrying this log? It's easier just to sit here beside it. Right? And so again, I say all this of when you choose a spouse, make sure it's someone that's going to be running that race with you. In Hebrews, it talks about laying away, laying down all the sins that so easily doth beset us and run your race with vigor. Where we're following towards Jesus, towards the end of the, that high calling that He's given us towards, right? And one day, when we're free from this world, we'll be with Him in glory and be able to enjoy it. But in the meantime, we've got a race to run. So, you know, the, the, the image may be the three legged race, right? You can run that. And if your partner's not running, you can get, get along, but it's going to be hard. But it's much, 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 much better to be running together, leaning on each other, encouraging each other, and building one another up. So these are a few and maybe scattered thoughts on marriage. But if you have any more um, questions on this, we can talk about it at lunch. Thank you all for your time and attention.